Hi class, Rachel Chase here, and in this chapter we will explore measures of center, dispersion, and position. These are going to be a series of videos split up by section, so let's begin with measures of center. Measures of center are probably something you've already become somewhat familiar with over the years. Some of the specifics you may have seen are things like mean, the median, and the mode of a data set. One more that we'll learn about here you may not have heard of before is the mid-range. Now, what makes this unique in our class, talking about measures of center, is that our end game goal here is to be able to describe what's happening with the data set and really interpret the results. So although there will be a lot of formulas here, the goal, again, is always to use that information to determine what's happening within your data set. So let's take a look at some formulas. Now, although this might seem literally Greek because of some of the Greek letters here, uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when you're calculating the mean, this is what most of us have heard referred to as an average before at some point in our life. Now, the reason in statistics you do not use the phrase average is because average can technically apply to any type of measure of center. So for us, what do we have to identify in order to use one of these formulas? Well, they all look really fancy, but at the end of the day, it just means add everything up and divide by the total number of whatever you had. Now, in terms of the type of data, in chapter one, you learned about the difference between population and sample data. When you have population data, the formula is gonna look like this. You'll notice this symbol right here, we call this mu. Mu always represents the population mean. So if you see it abbreviated somewhere, you should assume that that is the population mean, implying that your data is in fact a population. This E looking thing is a capital sigma, which if you're familiar with Excel, Excel uses this to denote taking the sum as well as other places in general. So anytime you see this capital sigma, that always means to take the sum. As we've learned about in our other chapters, n is always the size or amount of things that we have. If it's a population, then it's the population size. If it's a sample, then of course it's the sample size. And last thing here is x denotes each data value. So for example, if I have five tests throughout a semester, then x is going to denote maybe the 93 I got on the first test, the 82 I got on the second test, and so on and so forth. That number changes, so what we're saying here is, to put this all together, the population mean is equal to the sum of all of our individual values divided by the total number of values we added up, in other words, the population size. Now, in terms of the formula, it looks exactly the same as the sample mean. The difference here is that the symbol for sample mean is we refer to this as x bar. So nothing all that creative, just x with a bar over top. And again, that implies the sample mean of our data. You calculate the sample mean the exact same way that we calculated our population mean. The only difference, again, is the symbol that we use, which may seem insignificant at this point in the course. However, by the end of this class, and also if you plan on taking stats too, you may actually have both of these as data within one problem. So it's good to get comfortable with the symbols at this point in the course because by the end of the semester together, you will need to be able to identify them very quickly. The last mean that we can calculate is when dealing with grouped or weighted data. So what we mean by grouped data, that's referring to our grouped frequency distributions, which we learned how to create in chapter two. And weighted data, they're, they're both actually interchangeable, but weighted data meaning something like you know, for example, a, a course average. So if your grades are weighted, maybe tests are worth 60% and quizzes are worth 25% or something like that, that would imply a weight to it. So if you hear weighted average, it's the same formula for it. Now, the one difference, and I believe our, our book uses slightly different notation, but because we're being consistent to what we learned in chapter two, F, of course, means the frequency. M stands for midpoint here. Now, one question you might think is, well, what if my data is not grouped? How would I have a midpoint? If your data is not grouped and you're looking at weighted amounts instead, which we'll do an example of this later, 
consider for a moment that m is just whatever the data value is. So it's either the midpoint or the data value. So instead of trying to memorize multiple formulas, I mean, of course, you don't have to have these memorized, but instead of trying to think of it as something different, you really should treat it as the same exact thing. So keep in mind that these are interchangeable to each other in terms of midpoint or data value, depending on what it is. The one thing you do have to be very cautious of is when you're calculating a grouped or weighted mean, n is still the total sample size. However, do not be deceived. n is equal to the sum of all of your frequencies. So if you have a frequency column, you have to remember to add that up first to use that for your sample size. Next up, let's talk about the median. Now, the median is probably something you've seen before, and if not, the simplest way to find it is to list your data in ascending order, and then find the middle of it. So there's two things that could happen. You could have an even number of data, or you could have an odd number of data. So let's take a look at two separate examples here. So consider the first data set. I'm just going to make some numbers up. So I've already listed it in ascending order. Now what I want to do is cross off in pairs, one from each side, until I find the centermost value. So in this data set, 3 would be our median. Now, what happens if instead of having an odd number of data, we had an even number of data points? So let's try this example. I'm going to use the same process. They're already listed in ascending order. Cross off on either side in pairs. But then you'll see that we're left with two numbers in the center. So how do you calculate the median for an even data set? You take the mean of the two numbers in the middle. So to calculate the median, I'm going to add 4 plus 5 and divide it by 2 which gives us 4.5. Next up, we have the mode. The mode is always the number or class interval which occurs the most frequently. So this is the highest frequency. Now, if you had a frequency table or frequency distribution, all you have to do to find the mode would be to look at where the frequency is highest. If you have a list of data, then of course you have to actually count how often things occur. So consider the following. In this data set, what is the mode or modes? So if we look through, the number 1 occurs twice, 3 occurs once, 5 occurs twice, 9 occurs once, and 4 occurs once. This is an example of what we would call bimodal because there are exactly two numbers that occur the same number of time, times. So for this, we're going to say that the modes in this case are 1 and 5. If there's only one number that stands out as occurring most frequently, so let's say I added another 1 to this data set, then 1 would be just the only mode that there is. Now, technically, you could have something that's trimodal or more, but keep in mind you're trying to find out information about your data. So really, if there's more than two modes, it's not going to tell you all that much information. Now, what happens if instead all of your data occurs the exact same number of times? So an example of this, something simple like 1, 2, 3, 4. Technically, they all occur once, but that means that there is no mode because no specific number occurs more often than any others. Even if we changed it to something like 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, etc. Still, same situation. Each number now occurs exactly twice. But again, we say that that is no mode. And again, so on and so forth. You could list out these numbers 20 times each, and there would still be no mode. So what do you look for? There has to be at least one number that occurs more often than any of the others. The last measure of center that we should be familiar with is the mid-range. 
To calculate the mid-range, you take the maximum value in your data set, add it to the minimum value of your data set, and divide that by 2. So essentially you're finding the exact halfway point within your data set. For example, let's say we have a group of test scores. So let's say we have a, a 64, a 72, maybe we had a 60, a 95, a 99, and let's say an 87. So I'm going to first go through here and identify my max and my min. My max score is 99. My minimum score here was a 60. So let's say I'm curious what was the exact halfway point in the range of scores. I'm going to add those two numbers together. So we have 60 plus 99 and divide that by 2. This gives us our mid-range score of 79.5. So the halfway mark in that class would be a 79.5. Now, before we go into examples of mean, because we've already seen examples of the others here, you have to consider that some of these might be more useful than others depending on the context of the situation. So again, I have to really emphasize here, the purpose of this is not just to calculate how to do these things, but also to really understand what implications those might have. So while we go through this, I'm also going to be teaching you a little bit about technology. And again, the reason for that is to save us time. If the goal is to really interpret the data, you still need to be able to figure out how this works. So we're going to do some of these by hand, and you'll see later in this video, we'll start venturing into some technology applications. Let's take a look at this first example. The gross amount in millions of dollars earned in the box office for Harry Potter and the Half-Blood Prince. This is the first 14 days after the release are given below. Determine the mean, median, mode, and mid-range of this data. What are the pros and cons to each? So let's start by getting the basics out of the way. First and foremost, let's take a moment and calculate the mode. Which of these numbers occurs more frequently than all of the others, if any? So if I search through my list, I see I have multiple fours, I have multiple nines, and also multiple tens here. Each of those occurs exactly two times, and the rest of them only occur exactly one time. So we can say that our modes, in this case we have three, are four, nine, and ten. So before we calculate anything else, consider for a moment, does that tell you anything about this set of data? Does it tell you anything about the success of the movie? Uh, was it good, bad? What was the situation? Personally, I look at that and say, well, you know, four is not a good number. That's the minimum in this case. But 10 is somewhere, I mean, visually in the middle. But, you know, let, let's do some more and, and see what we find out. How about the median for our data? To calculate the median here, we have to list out our data from low to high and then find the center. So now that we've listed our data from low to high, let's cross off until we get to the center. And then you see here that we are left with two tens. So because we have an even number of data, just like we learned before, you're going to add them together and divide by 2, which gives us a mean, median rather of 10. So now what does this suggest? Well, the median value is $10 million, which also appeared as one of the most frequently occurring numbers. In this case, it's really just coincidence. So let's keep going, find our mid-range and also our mean. And then we'll see if we can make any decisions about what this might imply in terms of pros and cons. Our mid-range is going to be our max and our min divided by, added together and divided by 2. So we have 58 plus 4, divide that by 2, and that is going to give us 31. So right off the bat, as soon as we calculated the mid-range, we can see that number is much, much higher than any of the modes and also the median.
So last but not least, let's look at the mean. So one question we haven't necessarily answered yet is what type of data is this? Is this population or sample? So for some problems, you'll have to use your common sense because it won't necessarily be specified for you. So if you look at this and you say, okay, well, this is 14 days after release. Is a movie only in theaters for 14 days? No, generally they're in theaters a lot longer than that, even if they don't have as many showings. So if this is only a subset of the total amount of time it spends in theaters, we can say that this is a sample mean. To calculate our sample mean, you're going to go through and add all of our numbers up, and then divide that by the total of 14 days. So let's run through and add that up together. So we have a total of 229. Divide that by our 14 days gives us a mean of $16.4 million. So now that we have all four of these types of measures of center, let's discuss the pros and cons. As you could probably imagine, something like the mean or mid-range could definitely be swayed by outliers in our data. So if you recall, an outlier is basically a piece of data that's not necessarily appropriate or doesn't fit in very well with the rest of it. So, for example, if we're talking about the first 14 days, if everyone rushes out to the theater on day one and says, oh, wow, you know, great movie, then the rest of the days, the numbers will probably be pretty consistent. However, if everyone goes to the movie day one and finds out, ooh, maybe it wasn't such a great movie, the numbers might start to dip. If the numbers dip, that's going to end up being some type of outlier. So although in, in the last section of Chapter 3, we'll learn how to calculate outliers in terms of measures of position, at this point, identify something that seems out of place. When all of the rest of our data is between 4 and 29, and 58 is stuck in here, that might be an outlier. Outliers generally account for skewed information within our data set. So why is the mid-range and the, well, specifically the mid-range so high? Because it's considering the fact that we have that potential outlier in there. The mean, even, you'll notice, is boosted a little bit higher than both any of our modes and also our median. The reason for that also is you're looking at we have that potential outlier. So what's the pro-con situation? When you're interpreting data, you need to consider who are you interpreting the data for? If, let's say you were advertising, you love Harry Potter, right? So you're advertising, this was such a great movie, everybody should go out to see it. You might tell your friends, look, they, they're making, you know, an average of $31 million in the box office every day. So why can we say average? Because in statistics, an average can be any measure of center. If, let's say, you're working for a film critique company. You might want to use the mode or even the median to say, you know what, the movie's not really that great, people aren't loving it, they're not responding to it well, these numbers are generally a little bit lower. So when you're interpreting data, it's completely based on who your audience is. And something that's a recurring theme in not just our statistics class, but in life in general is you can make the numbers say and read out whatever you would like for them to say. It's part of the critical thinking and problem solving that you're developing in this course to really weed out and understand what's useful, what's important to you, so on and so forth. Stay tuned for the next part of this video.